We turn to the letter of Paul to the Galatians, chapter 2. Galatians, chapter 2. In the first chapter, Paul alludes to his conversion on the road to Damascus. And he was in Damascus for a while. Then he says in verse 17 of chapter 1, Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me. But I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James, the Lord's brother. Then chapter two. Then 14 years after, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me. So now this is after the first missionary journey. And I went by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But neither Titus, who was with me being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me, God accepteth no man's person, For they who seemed to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. But contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter, for he had wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. And when James, Cephas, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship, that we should go unto the heathen and they unto the circumcision. Only they would that we should remember the poor, the same which I also was forward to do. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I withstood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that, Brethren, certain, I'm sorry, for before that certain brethren came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, insomuch that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. But when I saw that they walked not uprightly, according to the truth of the gospel, I said unto Peter before them all. Now, many commentators take all the rest of the chapter as Paul's answer to Peter, not just a little part of verse 14, but the whole of the rest of the chapter is Paul's statement to Peter. If thou, being a Jew, livest after the manner of Gentiles, and not as do the Jews, why compellest thou the Gentiles to live as do the Jews? We who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners. Is is therefore Christ the minister of sin? 
God forbid. For if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. We stop in our reading of the word of God there. Verse 19 and 20 are the reason for our selection of this passage this morning. If I build again, no, for I through the law am dead to the law, that I might live unto God. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. We use this and other passages that we're going to find in the course of the sermon as the biblical foundation for Lord's Day 32. Lord's Day 32. As you can see, if you have your Psalters open, this is the first Lord's Day that makes up the third part of the Heidelberg Catechism of thankfulness. Since then we are delivered from our misery merely of grace through Christ without any merit of ours, why must we still do good works? Because Christ having redeemed and delivered us by his blood, also renews us by his Holy Spirit after his image, that so we may testify by the whole of our conduct our gratitude to God for his blessings, and that he may be praised by us, also that everyone may be assured in himself of his faith by the fruits thereof, and that by our godly conversation, others may be gained to Christ. Cannot they then be saved who, continuing in their wicked and ungrateful lives, are not converted to God? By no means. For the Holy Scripture declares that no unchaste person, idolater, adulterer, thief, covetous man, drunkard, slanderer, robber, or any such like, shall inherit the kingdom of God. Wretched sinners. That's the first part of the catechism. Graciously saved by grace alone, in Christ alone, through faith alone. That's the second part of the catechism will show thankfulness. Wretched sinners, graciously saved, will show thankfulness. The third part. The Heidelberg Catechism, as we've noted before, is not unique to have those three parts, those three divisions. That's what are the three principal parts of the doctrine of holy baptism. The same three. And when we are to examine ourselves in preparation for partaking of the Lord's Supper, those are the three parts, the three ways in which we are to examine ourselves, to find those three things, that I abhor myself for my sin, that I also know that Christ gave his blood for me, and that I am committed to showing gratitude, thankfulness. So, sometimes it's three S's, sin, salvation, service. Sometimes it's three G's, guilt, grace, gratitude. Those three parts are the real life of the child of God. 
we start that third part and we ask the question, and this is the theme we want to take, why must we do good works? Or as the catechism adds, why must we still do good works? The question arises, obviously, because the fathers in the second part have shown us that it's all God's work. It's all grace. It's all Christ. We don't contribute to our being saved in any way. It's all God's grace. Well, then, why must we still do if we're so saved? Some say we must, but the reason why they say we must is, well, it ranges. They would say we absolutely must still do good works, but the reason for wanting to do them or thinking the Bible teaches us why we must puts them in a ditch. There's the Pelagians and the Arminians who say we must do something in order to earn salvation. The Arminians were less than the Pelagians and they said we must open the door of our heart and let him in. He'll do everything else. We just have to put our name in the pay to the order of salvation check. Christ writes the check, he writes the amount of eternal salvation, he even signs it. We just have to fill in the line paid to the order of. That's all we have to do. Raise our hand, come forward. We have to do a good work. Still others want to say it's all salvation, it's all grace, it's all Christ. But they make faith a good work. We have to believe in order to be saved. But they do that perverting Scripture's language and making faith a work that arises out of man. So they would have, salvation, have good works prior to salvation. The position of the federal vision is no. They've got that front part all straight. But then they say... To stay saved, he saves us because they have everybody who's baptized saved. All of them are in the covenant. But to stay in the covenant, you have to add good works afterwards. So they still have good works arising out of man that he has to add to be saved. So they say, you must, but they're in a ditch. One of the things that we ought to realize is that it's very easy for our old man uh, influencing our thinking and our looking about our relationships on earth that makes us easily fall into that ditch. I've got to do something in order to merit. You go to work. You play a sport. You go to school. I've got to do something to get a good grade. I've got to do something good to stay on the team. I've got to do something good at the job or my boss is going to fire me or not give me a raise. I've got to do something. Our relationships. Sometimes we... Rather humorously, as males say, well, I've lost a few points this week. I'm in the hole. I've got to do something good in order to win her favor again. That all makes a thinking about the value of works as something that's necessary, but the necessity is that the works arise out of us. They're our work, and they merit. They earn something for us. 
And so when it comes to doctrine and, and theology, they earn for us salvation or earn for us the ability to stay saved. So there's one side. Good works, oh man, they're absolutely necessary. Now there's another ditch. Another ditch says, absolutely not necessary. They're not. And then it starts to sound right. And it goes like this. Because Christ has fulfilled the law, there is no longer any necessity for those in Christ to keep the law. There's no must for the saved in any way anymore. Or, we cannot keep the law. So the law only shows me what I cannot do, not what I must do. And with it, because of the knowledge of depravity, some would say the Spirit will work good works in me inevitably. So eventually I'll do them. Don't tell me that I must. And then part of that thinking, arising out of that natural inclination on our part about meriting, favor, some would say any reference to good works and the necessity of doing them makes people think that they add something to be saved or add something to salvation. And then we'll quickly think that we have a worthiness for our good works. So let's just stay away from talking about that at all. And then there's still more. There's one other version, and that is we're going to so emphasize God's sovereignty that man's responsibility is nullified. Now, there's, a, there's an attraction to that because then we want to keep all the praise and the glory to God. But then there's no must. Don't have to say must to any child of God because Christ did it all. Is that accurate? Then... If we say good works are not necessary for salvation, because salvation is merely of grace, what is the place of good works? None? Look at the way in which our fathers accurately summarized the scriptures in the way they asked the question. They do not say, do we have to do good works? They don't put it that way. It's not, do we have to? But it's, why must we do? Why must we do? We're going to do. We must. Why? Why must we still do? That's the right way to ask the question. They help us approach the issue correctly. Not do we have to, but why must we still do good works? We must. So the Heidelberg's question indicates the conviction that Scripture demands that those saved in Jesus do good works. So God's law does show us our sin. That's one of the ways in which the law works. But it also shows us how God wants us in our good works to express our gratitude for gracious salvation. And so the way in which we read the law this morning, the very introduction, God doesn't give the commandments to people who are not saved. 
God gives the commandments to those who are his people, whom he's redeemed out of the bondage of sin. Those to whom he constantly identifies himself as his, their God. I am your God. I've established my covenant with you that I will be a God to you and to your seed after you. I have that relationship with you. Now, here's the commandments that arise out of the relationship firmly and eternally and irrevocably established. You're saved. You will not be unsaved. Here's still the commandments. Let your light so shine before men. Don't cover that light of the salvation with a bushel basket. Let that light shine. You're engrafted into Christ. Abide in him. That you may bear fruit. The fruit of good works. So the question, again, is not do we have to, but the question is why must we still do good works? And the answer that the fathers gave in question and answer 87, we have a very interesting beginning to answer that question. Scripture teaches the must, the necessity of good works, because it shows us that the absence of good works indicates that one has no part in the kingdom of God. So they approach the question, why must we still? And they just simply state it this way. We, we must... Because the Bible makes it very clear that if we do not have any good works, we're not in the kingdom. I have to turn one page to Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God of God shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Ephesians chapter 5. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as becometh saints. You're saints. So let not these things be named among you, neither filthiness nor foolish talking, neither jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks for this ye know, that no whoremonger or unclean person or covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. 1 Corinthians 6. Know ye not that the unrighteous, unrighteous in their walk, shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revelers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Good works are necessary because the absence of good works indicates non-salvation. Now once again, the theme 
throughout Scripture is that the necessity of good works does not have anything to do with being saved or staying saved because, because good works don't merit. Now, all of our human nature, as we mentioned before, work, school, support, sports, or relationships, it seems that good works merit. But in relationship to God, good works don't earn. They do not merit. And the reason is simple. How can we talk about good works meriting when good works are gifts from God? When God foreordained that we should walk in good works, when he works in us to will and to do good works, then the performance of a good work cannot merit, but is all reason to praise and honor and thank him who gave them to us to be able to do. Remember that phrase, that hymn begins, I sought the Lord, and afterward I knew that when I was seeking him, he was the one who found me, and he worked in me the desire to seek him. And that's the idea. That's the scriptural concept of good works. Why must we do good works? Why must we still do good works. Our fathers answer that positively in that first part of answer 86. They say this first, Jesus Christ redeemed us and delivered us with his blood. He delivers us from the guilt of all past sin and every sin that I'm going to commit. He delivers me from the guilt of it because he paid it. He bore the punishment. That first. Jesus, with his blood, also redeemed us from the bondage of sin. Bondage of sin is sin has got me so bound up, I'm locked up, so that all I can do is sin. Christ, it is blood, paid for the guilt and Christ delivered us from the bondage of sin. He freed us so that we're no longer bound to sin. That's what it means to be dead in sin. All I can do is sin. Nothing else but sin. He delivered us from that bondage. How? He renews us by his Holy Spirit after his image after his own image. Romans 8, 29. He predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his Son. So election says God is going to perform a work of molding and shaping us to be like Christ, to be able to, quote, look, end quote, like Christ. We're going to start to think like Christ and talk like Christ and walk like Christ. And the Holy Spirit performs a work so that we who are by nature dead in sin, now by the work of the Holy Spirit, become alive. Alive. Galatians 2, verse 20. God performed a union of every one of the elect with Jesus. This is Romans 6 as well. So that we were baptized with him, we with him, into his death. When he was crucified, we were crucified with him. When he arose, we were with him in that resurrection. He lives. 
We live. I live. I was crucified with Christ, and now I live. That life is the rich fellowship that I have with God. I'm not bound in sin and dead in sin, so that all I can think is evil, sinful things. I've been delivered from that bondage. Now, with my mind, I not only can I still got an old man that can control that mind. They can get a hold of it. In fact, it's going to be natural for me to think evil things. But when God, by his Holy Spirit, works in me and I put on the new man, then I start, okay, I've got to think right things. I've got to think about Christ. I've got to think about God. I've got to look and seek the things which are above not the things only which are here below. That's natural. That's easy for me to do. I've got to work to think correctly, biblically. The Spirit is the one who works that in us. He enables us to be able to see the truth of the Scripture about the things which are above. He gives us to be able to know, do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe Jesus was the Son of God? Do you believe that God elected you into Christ? Did he put you together with Christ? We don't say no. We say, by his grace, yes, he united me. And when Jesus died, I died. And when Jesus arose, I arose. I live. I'm alive in Christ. I'm able to know God. Not just know about him. He knows me first. He always is working first. But then I know him. He sups with me, and then I sup with him. We live because Christ lives. Belong to Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. And he, by his spirit, is the source of my life. He, by his spirit, promises me to keep that life because it's the resurrection life of Christ. It'll never die. So that's why we talk about this. We've got new hearts, regenerated hearts. Those hearts do not have to be changed anymore. That spiritual heart that's regenerated does not have to be changed. When I die, my soul separates from my body and Christ immediately does a work on my soul, my inner being. The heart's already resurrected. Now my soul gets resurrected at the moment I die, and it goes and appears in the presence of Christ. And then when he comes again, then the third resurrection, that of my body, joining my soul. But three resurrections, one of heart, soul, body. We have heart resurrection. We've got to die to have soul. But that heart has the life of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. And that life is so powerful. It not only can never die, but it can influence correctly my mind to say, oh, be careful, little eyes, what you see and where you look and what you read. Oh, be careful, hands, what you do. Be careful, mind, what you think. And we heed that. Again, that's the nature of the Spirit working in us to will and to do his good pleasure, but that he tells us, my spirit's going to enable you to do it. And yet he comes with this admonition. You work out your salvation. He admonishes us, and that admonition wakes me up. Yes, I've got to be told. I've got to be renewed in my thinking. I've got to be Awaken from my spiritual lethargy. Instead of spending hours forgetting about him, I have to think about him. 
got to place him in the forefront of my mind. That we are able to obey is by the power of Christ's life. That we are enabled to endure affliction is by the power of Christ alive within us. But because we're still in the flesh, as Paul writes here in Galatians 2.20, the life I now live in the flesh. So scripture calls that a battle put on the whole armor of God. Scripture calls it a race, a marathon race. Not a quick sprint and you're done, but it's a marathon. You go on and on and you press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling. So we fight sin. So we're constantly fighting sin and we're constantly repenting and we're constantly told to watch and pray, the canons say. But when we live by the faith of the Son of God, a faith that comes from the Son of God, a faith that's worked in us by the Spirit of the Son of God, then that's our faith. We live. Our persons are not so neglected and nullified that it's Christ who's in me. No, I live. And I live because I'm aware of the connection between Christ and me. That's the way the apostle writes. And Jesus works that faith in him. But he works it conscious, consciously this way. That Nothing less than the Son of God. No one, not, not some human, but the Son of God loved me. And the Son of God gave up himself for me. Who am I? I am one that the Son of God loved and the Son of God gave up his life for even me. That's the conscious life, living thoughts wrought by the Spirit of Christ in the child of God. So does he say, let me sin. Grace is greater. Sin so grace will abound. Or, don't tell me what I must do. The child of God knows that there's a must in his life all the time. And that must is because I am not just in Christ. I'm, I'm living in the flesh. And as long as I live in this flesh... He must keep working in me to will and to do of his good pleasure. But again, when I'm all finished, I look back and say, did I do anything right today? Did I do any good work today? And we don't say no. Because a good work is that which arises from faith, when we had moments that we stood in amazement that the Son of God loved me and he gave up his life for me. And there's a new resolution, maybe repeated. I must respond correctly. I must respond humbly. I must respond gratefully then that commandment comes to us that way and he works within us so that his commandments are not grievous. The baptism form summarizes the third part of thankfulness this way. 
Whereas in all covenants there are contained two parts. Therefore are we by God through baptism admonished of and obliged unto new obedience. What's that new obedience? That I cleave to this one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I embrace him. When do you embrace him? You embrace him when he says to you and the Spirit enables you to hear it and it clicks. I will never leave you nor forsake you. When you go through the fire, when you go through a hard time, I'm going to be with you. You might not think it. You might not feel it. But my hand holds your hand. I am with you. It works when he says, Beloved, when he declares to us over and over, the Son of God loved you. In love God predestinated us. He gave you Jesus. Why? Because he loves you. And then you say, you know why I'm more than a conqueror? Because I know that nothing can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And what happens? We say, I love you too. I love you with my whole heart. I love you with a commitment that I want to do everything for thy glory. That's the way he works in us to will and to do his good pleasure. One more time, because now we're battling that flesh. When the catechism teaches us that good works are essential, they do not mean that good works merit. We're renewed by his spirit after his own image so that we're made to be like him. The spirit is never inactive. The spirit never goes to sleep. The spirit always is efficacious. He doesn't try to do something and fail. He always is effective. He continuing ceaselessly to work in us all the time. And he renews our minds and our wills so that we can want to obey. So the good we would and the evil we would not, that's the spirit working in us. And then the flesh. I do not. That I do. So why? Why must we still do good works? The first answer is very, very simple. Four answers we have. The first one is because God commands me to do good works. The summary of the law is not a wish, not a mere statement. It's an imperative. It's a commandment. Love the Lord thy God with all of thy heart, mind, soul, and strength. And that we need because we're in the flesh, to use the language of Galatians 2. So our fathers stated this way in the canon's 17th article of the third and fourth head. As the almighty operation of God whereby he supports and prolongs our physical life does not exclude but, in, but requires the use of means, I must rest, I must eat, I must exercise, I must drink. Those are the means that God uses to prolong our earthly life by which by which means God in his infinite mercy and goodness hath chosen to exert his influence. So also, 
with regard to the supernatural operation of God by which we are regenerated. No, in no wise excludes or subverts the use of the gospel, which the most wise God has ordained to be the seed of regeneration and the food of the soul. Therefore, the apostles and teachers piously instructed the people concerning this grace of God to his glory and the abasement of pride. And they neglected not to keep them by the holy precepts, by the sacred precepts. Professor Homer Huxima, in his big volume on the faith of our fathers, the Canons of Dort, translates sacred precepts, sacred admonitions. Let me read it again that way. We are not neglected to keep them by the sacred admonitions of the gospel in the exercise of the word, sacraments, and discipline. So, Today, be it far from instructors or instructed to presume to tempt God in the church by separating what God in his good pleasure hath most intimately joined together. Grace is conferred by means of admonitions. We need to be commanded over and over and over. It's not whether I have a choice to love my wife. Or I can do it when I want to. When I don't want to, he comes and says, you must. It admonishes us. And that's just one example of all the things that he would call us to do. Grace is conferred by means of admonitions. And then it adds this, very beautifully. And the more readily we perform our duty, the more readily we obey his commandments, the more imminent, usually, is this blessing of God working in us, and the more directly is his work advanced. Same thought in Canons 5. Second, why must? One, I'm commanded. Two, because we love him. Any of you who know love for another have gone through these situations. What do you want to do? I want to do whatever you want to do. Well, I want to do whatever you want to do. We love them. We love him. We want to do what he wants us to do. He wants us to bear fruit. He wants us to do good works. So then third, we do it because we're so thankful. The catechism speaks of that. That's the first thing. That's the whole of the third part of the catechism. Our gratitude. We're already saved, but now so thankful for what he has done. Gratitude for mercy that's new every morning. Gratitude for gracious salvation makes us, now here's some familiar words, sincerely willing and ready to live unto him. That's the end of the first answer of the Heidelberg Catechism makes us sincerely willing and ready to live unto him because we are grateful. We who have been forgiven much love much. And then fourthly this, God by his spirit enables us to desire to glorify God. Let your light so shine that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. John 15, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. Without following peace with all men and holiness, no one can see the Lord. God's glory is why we're created. God's glory is why we're redeemed. God's glory is why we must do good works. 
not to earn. He's earned it all. Not meriting, because he works them in us. But to show our love and thanks. To show we're alive. Christ lives. I was crucified with him, but I'm alive. I live. Still in the flesh, so I need admonitions. But I live. And I love the Son of God who loved me and gave up himself for me. Amen. Father, we ask thee to bless thy word. Take away everything that, if there was anything that man introduced, but may we see that it was thy word. And may we be convicted by thy word. And may it show us how we are to live to thy glory and honor. Thanks for thy love. Thanks for working in us constantly to will and to do thy good pleasure. For Jesus' sake, amen.